Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm joined in this episode by Andrea Stewart, author of The Bone Shard Daughter. This outstanding fantasy debut novel features seafaring adventures, a unique and cruel magic system, an ambitious emperor's daughter with holes in her memory, a wanted smuggler chasing a specter from his past, magical animal companions, creepy mystical constructs, and so much more. The Bone Shard Daughter arrived in stores on September 8th from Orbit Books. Andrea, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you for having me. I'm really stoked to have you on here. I'm gonna hold up the big pretty book here because this thing is 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 lovely. Um, just one of those gorgeous covers. Like it, it's one of those things that when the book gets solicited, you know, we shouldn't judge them on the covers and whatnot. But you know, you've got that shelf appeal. People immediately see it, and you're like, oh, this looks gorgeous. Um, there's something I've kind of learned over the last couple of years is uh, reading as many books as I do for this show and beyond just being a book fan in general um, is that increasingly I feel like I know whether I'm going to like a book within like a few pages. Like I feel like as soon as I start reading it, the author's prose, choice of words, uh, sense of flow becomes really immediately obvious. And there are times where I pick up a book and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to hate this. And then like I get 100 pages in. I'm like, no, nope, still hate it. And then, you know, that goes on the DNF pile. And other times where I pick it up and within a page, I'm like, oh, this is the good stuff. And that's exactly how I felt about the Bone Shard Daughter. Like within a page, I was immediately like, "Ooh, OK, I like this. I, li I like how this feels. I like the, the taste of this in my mind. And then I got a sense of the place and the world like. Lynn comes out and throws open shutters and there's the, you know, the, the ocean in front of her and the, the coastline and everything. And I was like, oh, this is a very different kind of space than I've been living in in most of my fantasy novels lately. So I was really, really excited about it. Um, it's so good. So I'm, I'm excited to have you on here. That's really good to hear. <laughs> um, I gave like the bullet point list of what's in this book at the start of the uh, episode. But how do you describe this novel when people are like, oh, tell me about your book? <laughs> it's funny because actually I give them kind of a bullet point as well. Like I tell them, okay, well, it's an epic fantasy in an Asian inspired setting and it follows several characters. There's a daughter trying to reclaim her rightful place as heir, um, a smuggler who professes not to care, but can't seem to stop doing good things. And then there's two women in an established relationship that are struggling with the class differences between them. And then there's a stranger on a remote island who's trying to unravel the mystery of why she's there. And all of these storylines kind of interweave, um, and it's all against the backdrop of a failing empire that's on the edge of revolution. So that's kind of like what I tell people. And then sometimes I'll add in about, oh, there's this magic system, this bone shard magic that powers these constructs, and all the citizens have to donate a shard of their skull, like that kind of thing. So, Yeah. Yeah, it's it's got to be so much fun whenever you're trying to figure out how to explain like enormous concepts uh, and really detail things. And I want to really I want to dig into that magic system with, you know, the titular bone shard stuff. Um, you know, there's other elements that I want to dive into, the constructs and, and all that stuff. Um, but kind of first, what I want to know is uh, you know, what was sort of the, the origin of this idea for you? If you can trace it back to original kernel of of, of a concept. Uh I can, and it's a little bit silly and mundane, but I was at the uh, San Antonio World Con, so it was quite some time ago, uh, with some of my friends, and we went to the food court, and uh, my friend Marina Lostetter, who's also um, a novelist, she writes sci-fi, and then also she's got like a fantasy novel coming out, but she went and got Chinese food at this um, food court, which is... You know, a food court in San Antonio, Texas is probably not the best place to get Chinese food. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was eh, questionable quality. And she um, almost choked on like a shard of bone that she found in there. And I was like, huh, bone shards. <laughs> so that was kind of the origin where I was thinking, well, what if that was the basis for a magic system? Uh, and I kind of grew it from there um, because I knew I wanted to write something with like an archipelago of islands 
I knew that I wanted to write something with constructs. So I kind of just thought about it some more and just built on that idea. I love whenever like authors can, can pinpoint the origin like that. Cause I mean, some people are like, I don't know. It just came to me and it's been floating around in my head for a while. Things like that. But I love a really tight origin story. I will mention that Marina's book is, let me see if I can lean the right direction, right directly behind me somewhere over here. I don't know. This thing's not mirrored. I don't know where I'm at. Um, it's back there. <laughs> Uh, her, her novel is back there, but yeah, that's super fun. I, I love to hear that. Um, what more can you kind of tell me about the world? Cause you mentioned like, there's, there's all these like nautical elements to it. Uh, and, uh, so you've got, you know, people on ships, people on the coastlines and a lot of concerns that are kind of, you know, there's, there's a, a, let's say a, a catastrophe on an Island fairly early in the novel, uh, that kind of sets a lot of things in motion. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it the inciting incident, but it is, uh, definitely relevant to kind of how things get going for a lot of the characters. Um, so yeah, like what can you kind of tell me about it? You mentioned that it's like, it's like, it's got like an Asia inspiration in it. Uh, and, uh, and then all these other elements. So like, you know, so please tell us more about the the world, kind of how it came together. And if you actually had to like maybe do some research to figure out how you would, you know, put some of those things in play. Yeah, I mean, I thought about it a lot. I mean, first off, I knew I wanted to do a setting on an archipelago of islands. Um, I've always been fascinated by that when I've been reading books, just because, you know, their islands often have slightly different like cultures or things that they can grow there, things like that. Um, and I did do some research. I mean, I was thinking that it's kind of tropical. Um, and usually in places like that, they have like a wet season and a dry season. Although in this world, um, the wet season and the dry season last for a really long time. And that's partially because the islands actually um, migrate. <laughs> so, so they'll actually like follow the season for several years before they go back to the other season. And that has a large effect on the islands as well and, and the way that they live. Um, so something that is in season during the dry season, for example, would be something that um, is quite valuable toward the end because people are like, well, we're not gonna get this again for a while. So it kind of drives like all that trade and everything. And that's like another thing is that um, trade between the islands is a, a very, um, big point in the book and, and uh, part of the background for the culture and everything. So one of the things I think is interesting about the way you like hand out exposition in this novel is there are a lot of small hints, throwaway, throwaway lines, uh, things that wouldn't necessarily immediately, uh, you, you know, like, I don't know, reach out and smack you in the face as far as like, this is super important, but you build on those things and they enrich the world. And by the time it becomes important, you've seeded it enough times to make it work. And uh, I felt like the migration of the islands is one of those things. Like the first time that gets mentioned, it's just, it's just a sentence. Like so literally it's like, well, I think it's, uh, I think, is it Jovis? Is that how you say the name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think Jovis even just kind of has a cast off idea of, uh, or maybe it's Lynn, but it's just like, oh, maybe it's just the islands migrating. I don't know. Like, um, and, and I remember hitting that point and being like, that feels like very specific language. I wonder what precisely that means. And I feel like the way you integrated those things in, in a lot of ways, um, are like that. And I want to tuck into that a little bit more here in a bit. Um, but first I want to kind of know more about the bone shard magic. I want to know like how that works. You mentioned it um, earlier where you're talking about how like the, it gets taken, you know, from somebody's skull. Um, but how does that work? What does it cost people to use it? Um, and how is sort of the power of the emperor built on that? So the bone shard magic, it's basically, um, used to power these constructs. So every citizen has to donate a shard of their skull. And uh, on their eighth birthday, they do a ceremony. Um, and they take that shard of skull from behind the ear. And uh, that actually goes to the emperor. It's like a tithe, basically. Uh, and the emperor uses these um, in these constructs. So these constructs are building from um, from different like parts of animals and things like that. And he's basically putting those together and then um, bringing them back to life 
by putting these bone shards in them. And um, they are powered through these bone shards. So if somebody dies during the ceremony, then their shard is basically useless at that point because the, um, the constructs are powered by the life force of those people. So that's like one of the things that is causing unrest in the islands is that people are kind of getting a little bit upset about it <laughs> because if your bone shard is in use, basically you start to feel like a little bit tired more often um, and you start to get like a bit more sick more often. And then basically it kind of cuts your life short because your life force is being used in these constructs. Um, I mean, there's more to it than that. So the bone shards are actually uh, also like a command system. So when he's putting these bone shards into these constructs, he's writing commands onto them. And um, so there's more than one used for each construct. And these commands are kind of in a hierarchy um, and they tell these constructs what to do and um, how they should act basically. Yeah, there's almost like a computing language element to it. Um, it's almost yeah. like series series of if then statements uh, that are kind of built into that magic. Um, I really thought that was an interesting idea, and I like how. And again, I don't you know want to give too much for people as they're as they're reading this, but um, that you know we're introduced to the bone shard magic and the way that it powers constructs. But our first kind of recognition that the, that this is damaging to people is Lynn going into the city and and uh, trying to convince uh, this guy to make a copy of a key for her. And in so doing, he asks about his shard and, and gives her the specific information she would need to locate information about him. And it's the first time where you get that sense of, oh, wait a minute, like, this is clearly valuable and it's clearly something people are sensitive about, but we don't really learn human cost and toll of that until later on. And, um, and again, I just, I like how you pace this novel, how you, inf you know, develop that information, the way that like it, you seed little bits and pieces of info. Um, and so that when it hits, it's not just, you know, it's clearly it's, you know, it's, it's showing and not telling, but it's also that like, you didn't hit us with a big expedi exposition dump. It was literally like, oh, you built this in my mind so that when the little revelations come, they matter and they sting a little bit for the reader to be like, oh gosh, this is what this is actually doing to people. Uh, so I think that's that's very, very cool. It's a really nice way for you to hurt us in our soul, Andrea, uh, <laughs> while reading the novel. Um, there's also another thing in it, and I, I feel like this is a little more minor as far as what we're talking about here, but there's uh, something called Whitstone. Uh, mm -hmm. that you gets used to power things. It's clearly valuable. It's clearly rare. Uh, how does that, what is that? How does it work within the world? Oh, basically it's mined from the depths of the island. And um, when people burn it, it brings uh, the smoke that basically summons a wind. So that is actually really useful for people for trade and everything. So, um, and it's also tightly controlled by the empire. So they basically like dole this out to people who have been like pre-approved, although there's obviously going to be a thriving black market for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, always. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so that guy kind of just gets doled out to doled out to people that are pre-approved and then they use that to fuel their trade. So the, em the emperor controls a lot of the trade in the empire as well. And then uh, another element that's seeded through here in the early stages, and I feel like Oh, it's like any good like fantasy movie or any good like D and D adventure or something. You get lots and lots of little pieces of things to start off with that build to something later, even if you don't realize they're important to begin with. Um, and there's something in this world's history, which is that the uh, this imperial structure that that runs all of these islands, this governmental system. Uh, it's their sort of lore of their people is that they came to power by defeating something big and terrifying. Uh, in in you know in their back history, um, mm -hmm. and again that's something that you play kind of coy with early on, and we just get little bits and pieces. Um, what can you tell us about that without you know giving away too much about the story, but how that matters to the characters, how it matters to the empire, um, and what you were kind of thinking about as you were introducing those elements? Yeah, so this is something that uh, becomes, I mean, obviously more important throughout the series, uh, but. Yeah, so the um, em the first emperor actually defeated these um, 
people that were called the Alanga, who were very, very powerful. They could control the elements and they ruled these islands. Um, but basically what happens is when you have that much power, you may not always care about the little people. Right. So, so they got into conflicts with one another and there was a lot of collateral damage. And yes, like you said, I play a little coy with it about what exactly happened. Um, but the first emperor did find a way to basically kill these people. And um, everybody was very grateful and basically, you know, installed him as their ruler. So the whole mythology right now, um, which may or may not be true, is that the emperor is keeping the Alanga from returning. So there's this idea that they may come back, but they don't, the people in general don't know, but they think the emperor maybe knows. <laughs> <laughs> and, so that's kind of one of the things that has been keeping people in line for so long and compliant with the whole um with the whole tithing of like a shard of their skull so uh, another thing that i want to kind of examine here um is i want to look at at the the pov structure um in this novel um so i think it's it's worth noting that uh like you mentioned that there are there are uh, several different POV characters and uh, but two of them are written in first person POV and then the mm -hmm. others are in third person. Uh, and I, I, I don't I mean, I can't say to this, like having like scoured my way through every novel released over a millennia, like how common this is. But I feel like in the last couple of years, I've been seeing a lot of particularly fantasy novels that have been structured this way, where it's kind of going back and forth between that, where I feel like before that would have been considered very avant garde. Uh, um, but now it's becoming much more common. So um, what made you decide to go with that, to have two characters that are first person, the rest of them in third person. Uh, what does that allow you to do, um, you know, as you're developing out these characters? Does it make things harder for you on the back end to kind of keep track of that stuff? How does that all work? Um, well, I had the idea that the two first person uh, point of views, uh, Lynn and Jovis, are basically like the two main characters around whom the story really centers and then everybody else is kind of orbiting around them in a way. So I kind of wanted to do that to differentiate them. Um, I also just like writing in both point of view. So that was <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, I've seen other people doing it. Um, so that was part of it, but it was like, you know, there's, there is a reason behind it. I, I did want to kind of, um, show those differences in some way um, on the back end, you know, it wasn't really that um, bad just because like I usually outline every character by themselves first. Um, although I did, there were a couple of times where I found myself writing something in first person or third person that I was like, Oh, what am I doing? This is the wrong, <laughs> this is the wrong character for that. Um, although that hasn't happened too often. So thank goodness. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I think one of the hard, like, most annoying things to have to do is to retense or like or change the pov if you've written something in one way and go back and do it the other because it's just labor it doesn't feel creative it doesn't feel like constructive in a lot of ways it just feels like oh i just need to restructure things so it's just basic editing but for me i mean i've, I've done that a few things with my own stuff and I, i'm always like oh why did i do this i'm just i just hate myself for it in the process <laughs> Like you said, like it focused those those first person characters are Lynn and Jovis. Um, the other characters are teased out pretty slowly. So even like the first like 100, 150 pages, we're mostly focused on those two characters. And then we get an occasional look at the other ones. Um, when you were doing that, I mean, is it is it just the sense of like this first story is really strongly about these two? And then you're kind of building on I mean obviously they all matter in this story. Uh, but, uh, you know, how did you choose to do that? Like as far as from a pacing perspective, as far as giving us heavily on a couple of characters and then slowly integrating the other ones? Oh, that, um, I ended up kind of moving things around a lot just to see where it felt right to be bringing in the other characters. Um, yeah, so that one was kind of a lot of trial and error, just trying to make sure, like, okay, am I bringing them in too late? Am I bringing them in too early? And 
I think with that kind of thing, um, it is going to be too early and too late for some people, but I wanted to try to find like, where <laughs> it was feeling like about like, you know, maybe for most people this would work. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was kind of some trial and error trying to figure out when was the best time to start bringing in these other points of view. I know it's a little bit confusing for some people just because the uh, back cover copy is just the one point of view. Um, so some people go into it thinking it's just the one, but uh, yeah, it's <laughs> several. So. The thing that we've talked about a lot on this show is how often like marketing blurbs and the, you know, the way things are described for for sale and for promotion usually focuses in on maybe one character or one kind of core element of the story. And it would be really easy to read this and be like, oh, this is all Lynn's tale, where I think even once the, the when the novel gets started, we start off with Lynn, we go to Jovis, we go back to Lynn. We go to Jovis for a couple of, of chapters and then you're kind of mixing you know, it back and forth. Um, and I, I kind of just wonder if for a lot, a lot of people that are first jumping into it and they're like, it's, oh, I, I didn't know what I was what I was seeing here. And I don't know, I, I, I increasingly wonder if 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 books need to have like a, a little bit of a tag to let them know. I know there's a lot of like the archive of our own kinds of things that um, yes, I've see. seen that. Yeah, like Tor leans into that a lot harder these days. And um, I don't know that it matters that much to a really broad audience of readers, but it's certainly helpful sometimes. Clearly, if you read Amazon reviews, you know that uh, there's a whole genre or a whole group of of uh, Amazon reviewers that get uh, severely offended by naughty words and will give a book <laughs> one star if the F word appears somewhere in it. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I don't know. It's like it, sometimes I just want her to be like, you know, book may not be what the blurb describes or something. I don't know. But I mean, clearly your your blurb does a good job of giving you one aspect of it. But there's a lot more going on besides that. Um, but I guess that's probably a good segue to talk about the characters in individually and like what they're here for and what they're doing in this story. So um, I I mean, I want to talk primarily about Lynn and Jovis, but um, but then uh is is it Falu? Ah, uh, Falu. Falu. Okay, so mm -hmm. Falu and then San. San kept it easy for me anyway. Um, uh, that you know that we can we can kind of talk about. But um, first off, let's just talk about Lin because this is a character who is is their emperor's daughter. So it comes from what would be a place of privilege, but has lost some of that privilege because of this illness that she suffered that has a really interesting effect. So can you kind of tell me about that circumstance and um, how that affects her attempt to claim her birthright? Well, so that is um, an illness that her foster brother brought to the palace. Um, so he got sick with it first and then she did. And then he has regained a lot of his memories, but she is still trying to regain her memories um, from, I think it's about five years before. She can't seem to remember any of that. And because of this, her father is constantly telling her that, you know, you're broken and I don't know if I can trust you and I don't know if you should be heir. So that affects um her goals and what she wants because she just really wants to please her father in a lot of ways and she wants to be the emperor um and so that kind of sends her in her whole quest to learn bone shard magic without his approval to basically prove that even though she can't seem to remember these things that she's still you know worthy of being his heir i thought there was an intriguing idea there which was that the the emperor feels like since she cannot remember her life before five years previous that, it, that she's just not the same person to him that you know that he can't trust her motivations that more or less that like the person she was before was kind of swept away um mm -hmm. and i th um I, I recently read the book of m uh by uh pung shepherd which also deals a lot with memory and how it affects people and how they view the world and how they react with each other and so um now a very 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 different novel but i thought it was interesting to kind of encounter two different books that approached memory um in in, in interesting ways and so i really like that aspect and i like the the fact that you know she's dealing with somebody who it's her father but he just doesn't even see her as kind of the same person anymore because of it and there's a lot of intrigue in her own life as somebody who is in the place that she's always been and yet at the same time is 
it you know doesn't remember all of it. There's a moment where she encounters this door in a, in a locked away in a room that she hasn't been in, uh, and when she goes into it, she realizes that she recognizes that door and that it it should mean something to her. There's a familiarity to it, but at the same time, you know, she doesn't have any of those memories between you know before five years ago. Um, and I really like that that kind of thing playing out that the the idea of having a mystery in front of you that shouldn't be a mystery it shouldn't be something that you don't understand but because parts of you are locked away um you're almost like you know digging away at yourself trying to extra ex, you know excavate those ideas so i thought that was very cool jovis on the other hand is a smuggler um is born of kind of two different worlds as far as his family lineage which makes him really kind of not connected to either in a lot of ways uh and uh is in this process of constantly chasing um i, I he's chasing a ship but the ship mm -hmm. is more than that the ship represents the loss of his wife some years earlier um and the only link he has to why she disappeared and why his life kind of unraveled afterwards and um, and I think that like, there's a great deal of fun in this character, even though everything happening around him is not fun. Um, <laughs> Jovis as a character is fun in a lot of ways. Uh, what can you kind of tell me about what he's doing and, and, uh, and then maybe a little bit about the companions that he makes along the way? Yeah. I mean, for him, um, his is kind of like this journey through, um, I would say like grief in some ways because his wife has been missing for seven years and he's always chasing this ship because it was uh, the last um, clue that he has when she disappeared basically um, without a trace. So that's his main goal and he's been doing a lot of other things in pursuit of that goal such as smuggling. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how he starts the story is that he just cares about this one thing is trying to find his missing wife. So that kind of leads him in a lot of different places, just chasing down rumors of this boat and finding um, other people that have had their family members or loved ones disappear in a similar manner. Um, and then he does meet this creature along the way <laughs> that um, is later named Mephi, um, that he saves from drowning. And he kind of starts to care about something else. And that kind of brings him back to the present world a little bit. So that's kind of like what I wanted to deal with, with his character, where he's just always stuck in this loop, basically, of this past, because he can't find a way to resolve it. But at the same time, like, life is still moving forward. Yeah, I I think that particular story arc is super compelling. Um, but I'm also just a giant sucker for animal companions too. So the introduction introduction of of Mephi um, is really fun. Uh, and and again, the way you've kind of layered the story back and forth, I feel like we we meet this creature, and then a chapter later, in somebody else's POV, we get like a little piece of something that teases that maybe this isn't what Jovis thinks it is. Um, at least that's what it felt like for me, where I was like, oh, I see you, Stuart. You're being sneaky here. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I, I really love that kind of world building. I love where, like, I, I say this sometimes on the show, but I like to work. Um, when I read a story, I don't want everything handed to me. I want to find the building blocks. I want to piece the elements together. Um, I don't want it just kind of, handed to me i want to you know i want to do the work for it so um because it makes me feel smart and special whenever i get to that point where i'm like i figured something out oh, i'm smart um yeah so i i always love that when i get that and uh and i was digging that for sure uh, within the story um there's several other uh pov characters although they are the third person characters i mentioned earlier sand sand appears i mean like in the first 150 pages like once maybe twice um mm -hmm. and and the and and Sans uh, sections are very uh, intriguing, but um, but not very straightforward about what they're about. Um, without giving away the the, the storyline here, um, what can you tell us about that character? Well, with Sand, um, sh she's kind of trapped on this uh, island that's on the very edges of the Empire um, with other characters 
uh, and she doesn't really know why she's there or how she got there. And this isn't something that she becomes really aware of until that first chapter. Um, basically, she's just been in that kind of loop where she's doing the same thing every day, and then something happens, and she starts to realize that this is not normal and there's something else going on here. So her chapters are basically kind of uncovering why they're there and or how they're there and like how they're they can maybe get away from this island <laughs> so, yeah it's it's a little bit yeah her chapters are a little bit strange i think but you know it all connects in the end it's like a, uh it, it, it almost feels like an interlude like you have these other stories that have a lot of forward momentum and then you make the jump to sand for a little bit and uh, and you you I don't know there's a sense of disorientation um, in those and not in a bad way like I just feel like for a moment you're kind of floating in this very um, disorienting uh, situation um, and then you get right back into you know the, the the main plot and so I think those things are interesting because again you're seeding little elements and building on them as they go with I'm gonna say it wrong again Falu Falu. Uh, Fallu, yeah. Fallu. Like when you, you have Fallu, who's another one of the characters, and there's an additional uh, uh, POV character that comes later, but I almost feel it's kind of spoilery to talk about who that is. Um, that may be uh, more complicated than, or less complicated than I'm making it sound like, but I feel like it's easier to talk about Fallu here. Um, here you have um, a, a character who's in another kind of interesting predicament um, because of their place in the world and how they relate with people. So what can you tell me about her? Well, with her, uh, she's actually a governor's daughter um, on one of the islands, and her um, girlfriend is uh, from basically from the streets. She grew up on the streets. So they have like a very differing viewpoint of the world and what is okay and not okay. I mean, Fallow comes from this place of privilege, and she lives in a palace, and you know, she hears the same things from her father who lives a very decadent life lifestyle that he's like, I deserve this and this is why, and this is why those people don't deserve it. Well, <laughs> her girlfriend, Renami, is like, you know, that's not actually um, true about these people and uh, your dad's not that cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they have this conflict in their relationship where they really – like genuinely love and care about one another, but there's this huge class divide between them and they're trying to figure out like how to bridge that gap while at the same time dealing with this brewing revolution. Yeah, I, I, Falu is, is fun for me uh, just thinking about the fact, well, I mean, it's established early on that um, she's a little bit of a player like, uh, yeah, definitely yeah. Is, she's a woman about town. Um, she knows what she's into and, and, uh, and she enjoys herself, but we're, we're seeing that that is kind of who she was. And now she's got, she's found somebody that she's really smitten with, um, and is having to work to keep that relationship. Um, because there's, it's definitely a little bit on the rocks as it first arrives. And, um, there's a very, uh, like her first scene is really fun because you see her working with like, I think it's a, sort of like the captain of her guard or somebody who works within the, the, uh, um, the, you know, the governor's, uh, guard and, um, and they're sparring. And at the same time, she's kind of working through her uh, relationship problems and emotional issues. And the guard is like, he's definitely there to help. But at the same time, it's like, I don't. I don't think I'm the right person to talk to about this thing you have going on. Maybe you should be talking to her, maybe. Um, and I, I thought it was a really fun scene, and I thought that set up the things that were going to come really well, um, uh, too. So I thought that was very, very cool. Um, are you well, – I mean, let's talk about process a little bit here. Are you an outliner? Are you a discovery writer or a pantser? What's well, that process look like for you? Definitely an outliner. Yeah, I have to have – the chapters outline. So basically, I mean, the first thing I'll do is um, think about, you know, the world and the characters, and then I'll sit down and write a chapter or two just to kind of get the feel of what is the world like? What is the character's voice like? What do I want this to feel like? And once I feel like I have that established, then I sit down and I write a detailed outline. So I'll go through, and for something like this, where it's um, multiple points of view, I outline each one individually. Um, just so I can get like that sense of what is the arc here? Like, how does it start? 
what does the character care about? Like, where's the climax of that arc and where does it end? And then I go through and then shuffle the chapters around <laughs> until they make like chronological and story sense, which is what I was doing with that beginning part before. Um, and then once I do that, I start writing basically. Uh, I don't always stick completely to the outline. <laughs> I don't uh, think it's possible. When, no, which is when I have to go back and like re-outline <laughs> whichever part I messed up. Um, but that's like my general process for that. How, when you're, I, mean, I like how you say basically you're kind of like, you're outlining the separate characters first. So you kind of know each one of their stories. But when you know that there's, they're going to intersect at some point, um, how do you handle that? I mean, obviously, when you, you have to merge it all together into one you know full narrative, but even in those separate outlines, at what point you're like, uh, person A meets person B here and then draw a line on the piece of paper somewhere. I mean, like, you know, how do you keep track of that? Is it a visual thing or is it just notes or how does that work? Uh, well, I, I use Scrivener and then I basically have like um, I have like a more detailed one and then I have like little little note cards. Mm -hmm. So then I'll have like a little th like note on there about the important things that happen in the chapter. And then, you know, you can kind of drag and drop things around that way. <laughs> so that's how I can kind of keep track of, oh, they meet this character here, which means this chapter has to go here. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense in the context of the other story. So that's kind of how I handle it. Well, you answered my next question, which was tools of the trade by mentioning Scrivener. And um, I always think it's interesting on this show where, uh, I mean, there's a lot of Scrivener users who are guests on here. And I'm a Scrivener user myself, and I love it and evangelize for it every chance I get. Uh, a lot of other people find it too confusing, too complicated, too much going on. And, uh, and the discovery writers are the people who just get into a Word document and just go and go and go and then figure out later they have to move things around. And I, I'm a modular thinker, so I love that idea of being able to say, oh, this really belongs here, you know, or be able to, or this, you know, this doesn't need to be here at all. And it's easy to yank out. Um, so I, I literally feel a little anxious when some of the writers are talking about the, oh, I just wrote, I don't know, 150,000 words in a stream of consciousness and I'll figure it out later. And I'm like, whoa, no, no, no. Um, I'm like, I'm getting a panic sweat. Just think about that idea. So, um, so you, you, you helped me out there. I felt good. I was, uh, everything you said there, uh, felt really nice to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Along with that, do you, have, do you have a plotting method? Do you have any specific uh, methodology you adhere to, whether that's, you know, three or four act structure or save the cat, 15 beat, seven point system? I don't know. There's so many, so many different names. Uh, not really. I mean, I kind of keep those things in mind as far as, you know, everybody's story has to have an arc. It has to have a beginning, a middle, an end, you know, the dark moment, like their struggles, their try-fail cycles, like things like that. So I, I definitely keep those things in mind. And um, before I do that outline, sometimes I'll jot down notes as far as like, this is what they want. Um, this is how it's going to end. This is how they're trying to get to that thing. This is like their points of failure. Um, these are the cliffhangers I want to put in there. I'll put that in sometimes. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, so I kind of like keep those things in mind, but I don't really do anything very strict as far as that goes. And then what does your revision process look like? So after you get that initial, <laughs> I love that face. But yeah, after you get, you know, that initial put together, maybe get some feedback on the first draft or, you know, what, is, what does that first draft look like for you then? And then, yeah, like what does revision look like? Well, it depends on how messy the draft is. Um, this one, I was really lucky. It was not very messy. Um, I had to rewrite a subplot, but that was the biggest thing that I had to do. Um, but yeah, basically I'll go and I'll do a read through and I'll be like, okay, this doesn't make sense or I have to tighten this or I have to fix this and I'll keep another document full of notes. Um, sometimes I'll do that like while I'm doing the draft because I'm like, this is terrible. I'm going to fix this later, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so once I get that all together, then um, when I move on to revisions, I'll go through and uh, basically order them by which is the most difficult thing. Like what is the biggest thing, what's, what's going to make the biggest change here? So for um, the Bone Shard Daughter, when I knew that subplot was not working, I knew that was the thing that I would have to, have to tackle first. Because the thing is, like, although it's a lot more appealing for me to want to tackle the small things first, the big things are usually going to affect the small things. Right, <laughs> so right. It just makes less work for myself to do it that way. So I make a checklist. Um, 
because I find it's really hard to do revisions without really um, having that same kind of progression that you do with uh, rough drafts where you're like, oh, well, this is how many words I wrote today. This is how many words I think it's going to be. So this is my progress bar. So at least with a checklist for revisions, I can like check something off and feel a little bit satisfied. Like, oh, look, I've, I've made progress. So this is how far I am through it. So that I've, I've found to be a very useful tool in dealing with revisions. Everything you're talking about sounds like the way I approach things in that standpoint of just giving myself small wins. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, I, I feel like sometimes like just like I had a, a huge project, this I'm in a book. I mean, you know, this is this is no, you know, tiny book. It's not it's not a door stopper, but it's like it's right about the right size for, for what I'm looking for in a fantasy novel. And uh, but like, but that's, you know, it's a big production to do. And um, that idea of thinking of it as just one unit is so daunting to me. That idea of like, this is what I I have to start this and complete this. And that's it. Like, I can't do that. I need like all those little bits along the way. So even you talking about having the checklist is great. Uh, do you ever leave yourself little notes in it that are, you know, that kind of moment of like, oh, insert idea here or oh, write yeah. something smarter here or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then I curse my past self. I'm like, oh, oh gosh, what was I thinking? You know, like yeah. come up with something more clever. I'm like, gosh. And, and now I'm thinking like, I, I've, I've got to do the work of coming up with something more clever. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, you're like, uh, yeah, past me, I don't like your tone. I don't like what you're assuming about me here. That's, <laughs> I feel like I, I'm trying to remember if it was like Shannon Chakrabarty or maybe Roshni Choksi. I had seen talk about that on Twitter at one point where they had gotten to a point in their manuscript where they'd left the, like, say something smart here. And they're like, real helpful, Shan. Real good job. Thanks for, <laughs> you know, really giving me an assist here. So, uh, yeah, that stuff endlessly uh, entertains me. Uh, well, like I said, I said at the top, um, the Bone Shard Daughter is coming out from Orbit Books uh, on September 8th. Um, so from the point of where we're talking about a week away. Um, and this is the first and this is your debut novel. Uh, yes. Doesn't read like a debut uh, in the sense that this is a very finely crafted novel, great prose, great characters. I wouldn't, I actually like when I was doing the research to write the opening for this, I was surprised to see that you were a debut novelist. I really expect that you had uh, a lot more. And I imagine you've got a lot of work that, you know, people haven't seen yet, but I have a lot of stuff in the trunk. We'll just say that yeah. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. But the craft on display is excellent. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see where this goes. Where should people be following you so they can keep up on this series uh, and uh, to see where you go next with your writing career? Um, well, I'm most active on Twitter right now. That's uh, so my Twitter handle is Andrea G. Stewart. So I'm on there. Um, and then I also have my website, which I try to keep updated. Uh, it's AndreaGStewart.com. <laughs> um, and then I'm I'm like figuring out Instagram, which is, you know, I don't know. And then I'm I'm on Facebook as well, but I don't I don't really update my author page. I just have my personal page, but yeah, it's all public. So I love that you mentioned you're trying to figure out Instagram. I was having a uh, Twitter conversation with Evan Winner today about Instagram and how we're like, we don't get it. We don't do it right. Um, it's hard to learn another thing. It's also owned by Facebook. So, you know, ew. Um, and <laughs> like, just trying to figure out how to use every platform well. I see some people just killing it on some of them. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I go to it myself and I'm like, am I just old now? Am I tired? It, like, is the world beaten up on me too much? Like, I, why do I get anxiety when I open stories? I don't understand this. I just, I don't think I need this in my life anymore, but it's pretty books look really nice on it so oh, i don't know every time i see people post about my book on instagram i'm like wow i need to up my photography game because they make it look so so gorgeous yeah you just let them do it you write the pretty words you let them make the pretty pictures and uh, everybody's in their element that way because otherwise i'm like try i mean i'm a jack of all trades and even i'm at that point where i'm like i can't learn anymore just go easy on me <laughs> right like just not people pop up and they're like what about tiktok and i'm like no GTFO. I don't even want to hear it. I mean, like, it's cool when it pops up my Twitter and it makes me laugh, but like, no, I'm not going anywhere near it. I don't need another platform. I have to learn. It's bad enough that I'm, I'm on YouTube now, right? Like, like now I got to figure out how this works. I've been a podcaster. But I have to look at my own face and video. This is, this was a horrible idea. I don't even understand why I chose this path, but, <laughs> um, well, uh, Andrea, like I said, September 8th, book comes out. It's out from Orbit, one of the uh, the finest publishers of science fiction and fantasy novels out there. Uh, 
I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I think people are going to really latch on to this. Um, it's exciting. It's fresh. Um, there's really fun characters. It's a world I feel like you can dive into really quickly. Um, did I mention there's animal companions? I love animal animal companions. Um, and I think it's just terrific stuff. So um, I hope everybody goes and checks it out, gets it from all the places where books are sold, support your indie bookstores if you can. Otherwise, buy it wherever it's available to you. And uh, Andrea, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching this first video episode of Fictitious. If you're new to the channel, Fictitious has been a podcast for a number of years, and there are over 50 previous audio-only interviews with authors already available to you, both here on YouTube and all the usual podcast apps like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. I'm excited to make the leap to video here on YouTube, though, and I hope you enjoy seeing your favorite and soon-to-be favorite authors here in conversation. If you enjoy this episode, hit like, subscribe, leave a comment. You know how it works here. Let me know who you'd like me to feature on the show and your favorite writing takeaways from this interview. More to come soon. Thanks for watching Fictitious.